Okay, I hit record. Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the 13th webinar on Awakening the Higher Mind and the Intuition through the Use of Symbols with Dwayne Carpenter. He always has interesting stuff for us, but um, first he's asked me to do an announcement. Um, the Moira Federation, the University of the Seven Rays, um, and the Seven Ray Institute, we're all having our annual conference. It's the 33rd conference. It will be from April 30th to May 12th in Chandler, Arizona. And for those of you who are interested in checking it out, you can go to our Moira Federation website. It's www.moirafederation.com. Dot com. That's our public website and uh, on the first page there you will see the announcements and the top announcement is for the University of Seven Rays 33rd Annual Conference um, and it'll take you to the website uh, where you can look at the uh, the different parts of the conference that are being offered, the pre-conference workshops, the main conference itself, um, hotel reservations, that kind of thing. So we hope to see some of you there. Excellent. And then did you want me to um, read the Ray information first before you start? Uh, I would say just a little further in where we okay. actually get to the section on cycles. Okay. But it's important. Okay, well, I want to extend my appreciation for everyone who's taken time from their busy schedules to participate with us. I'd also like to give my appreciation and thanks to PL and Rose for their technical guidance and assistance, without which this presentation would not be possible. So let us basically we're going to be reviewing spherical ray charts. And most of you who have studied the Ageless Wisdom teachings know that until you have a sense of what astrological influences are impacting you and the different rays of your sixfold vehicles, which centers are being activated, it's somewhat difficult to really get a placement of where you are and where you need to go forward. Now, a lot of this is intuitive, but it's important to have a good monastic or mental base that can really build a good scaffolding. So, on our first image that we're sharing, You can see seven sacred men or women with their unique rays, starting from ray one and going down from left to right to ray seven. Now, those are the colors normally associated with the seven rays, but there are many variations, and it would be beyond our scope to go into that right now, but let's just say those are usually considered the dominant colors. They also have notes, and these notes fall onto different octaves, and that's another area of research and study we'll go into in greater depth and detail. You have the soul ray, just under the personality ray, and there you have the seven egoic lotuses, and each one is tinged by 
its unique quality or call it light. And then we go into the group dynamic or the monadic ray. And I want to ask the question, how many who are attending this presentation have a sense of maybe what their rays may be? Could we have a show of hands? Now this, if you don't know what your monadic ray is, that's all right. <clears throat> and even if you don't know your soul ray, that's all right. But do you think you have a general idea of what your personality ray is? Your threefold lower vehicle <clears throat> of lower mind, emotional, physical, etheric. Okay, well, that's important for me to know. Now, go ahead. Somebody has a question. I was just going to say there wasn't a lot of them, but uh, yes. there was there was enough. Okay, excellent. This presentation should, in some small way, inspire any of you who maybe don't know what your rays are for a number of really important reasons, and we'll review that as we go through the presentation. Now, when you look at the six-fold ray chart tabulation that you have in front of you, you'll see at the top sort of the way that DK via Alice A. Bailey presented sort of the ray chart. Now, he didn't deal with the monad. Uh, maybe in private letters to disciples in the Dina books, he may have. But to my knowledge, he never gave any charts with the monad. But we've added that because it's 75, 100 years later, and there should be, hopefully, people that are not only responding to their soul ray, but embryonically to their one monadic life. But again, if you don't know what your monadic ray is, or even your soul ray, that's fine. So it's laid out by Alice Bailey in the upper, the upper part. Now, looking down, you'll see where I have basically the same outline, only I've added the ray colors. And once again, going back to the previous chart, monadic ray one, red, fire. Second ray, soul, love, wisdom, personality ray, harmony through conflict, the great fourth ray. The lower mental is the third ray, green. The emotional ray is like the soul, second ray in this particular person's chart. And then last but not least, the physical etheric body uh, in its ray is predominantly presented by violet. But I have to s share one interesting uh, sidebar here. All of the seven rays have seven subrays. So even if you are given in any particular incarnation a certain set of rays, as, as we're outlining here, you often can pick up through the subplane coloring, sound, influence, vibration. It will not be dominant. It will be a subtone, or what DK calls a subcolor. But that's an important consideration that we're not just given this equipment and then we're sort of isolated and we can only work with those rays. Another factor is that <clears throat> as you go from an integrated personality where you've organized the substance in the lower mental, astral, and physical etheric, the rays begin to overlap and blend. They have their distinct characteristics. They have their life on the inner planes. And they're basically 
spherical. And as we're going to explore, and as we have explored pretty consistently through all these presentations, you have to see these, you have to see these rays as being spherical. And what you're looking at right here is the same chart that we saw earlier in the picture before this, the tabulation. Same identical layout, only what I've done is I have put them into a circular tabulation, starting with the outer periphery, most obvious, seventh ray physical etheric, astral, blue, going from bottom up, mental, green, personality, four, yellow, soul, ray, blue, and then the monad red. Okay, now this is a very simple chart, but it's important that you see where we've made a transition. And in the next few slides, we're going to explore how different it is to look at the rays. And this is true of the planes. It's true of the solar angel on its own plane. It's it's true of the egoic group that you're a part of, the master's ashram, to see these living lives as being spherical, but being able to nest one within the other without any violation of the integrity of one or the other. In other words, you see this in physics you see at atomic and subatomic levels where electrical and magnetic forces they they take they they form into discrete bands around the nucleus and they are more like clouds and when one is stimulated sufficiently that particular band goes radiatory and it literally jumps to the next higher octave. This will be for another presentation, but quantum mechanics and uh, physics are making incredible breakthroughs in revealing what has only been hinted at by some of the ageless wisdom teachings, what DK called the, the movement into the fourth and third subplane counting from below up of the physical etheric. Okay, are there any questions up to this point on the charts? How we've gone from side, sort of a, a, a linear chart to one that we've added color to, the color of the rays, and now we have a spherical chart. And before any questions, just one last thing. In this particular chart, we have an added quality of the rising sign, the sun sign, and the opposite of the sun sign, which in this case, uh, if you have cancer sun, you, the opposite of that is Capricorn. And there's a particular reason for that. There are some very advanced meditations that the Tibetans shared privately, and it relates towards the zodiacal meditations and you actually use those three aspects of your astrological chart to do certain types of visualizations. Okay, good. Are there any questions up to this point? Um, you have a couple of comments in there yes. from your earlier question. Um, Sally, uh, she says she's new to esoteric astrology, so she, at this point, um, doesn't understand her, her rays or esoteric astrology, but we'll, you'll get into some of that as we go along. And then Bruno shared that um, he is probably a sixth ray personality, second ray soul, uh, possibly a second ray monad, so... Excellent. You got you got the people thinking, and then Francis um, has his hand up. So let's see if we can. Okay, Francis. Can... Do uh, I need to do something? I hear can you. you. Hear, can I you can. Hear me? I can. Quick question or thought. 
Some have said that at this time, the avatar of synthesis is playing a much greater role in stimulating the process that you've alluded to in blending, overlapping, we'll say synthesizing these rays, especially for those who are approaching, as you've noted, an integrated personality or perhaps have stepped on the path. Any thoughts on that? Yes. It's sort of like the Maha Chohan, the Buddha, the uh, Christ, all expressing different rays, but all united in the one ashramic push of the Christ to bring all these different redemptive forces. Now, maybe the Buddha has taken off for higher work at this particular time historically, but that first ray is, is in, in that brilliant mental understanding is, is still there in the ethers. This is what the uh, Buddhists call sharing the vestments, that when a master or high adept kicks the body, they still remain some aspect of their lower vehicles to keep in touch with their disciples and humanity. And I might add that uh, when you have a lot of 246 in your chart, that you're apt to find visual images much more comforting, much more invocative than simply explanations verbally or text. And we all know how the Tibetan has indicated that the great second ray is really the ray of divine geometry. And it really deals with vibration, color, and sound more than the other rays, particularly the 1357. And they're not exclusive of each other. And it's very rarely that somebody has a lot of one and not a little of another. But <clears throat> in the Dina books, I was very impressed to find that Whenever the Tibetan found some of his students leaning too much towards the masculine side of with the 1357 ray polarization, he would give them meditations that were colorful. He would tell them to go listen to the great symphonies in the world because it helped bring equilibrium, balance, and, and vice versa in the other direction. If, if there was a natural born occultist that uh, had a very powerful mind, was tuned into the will and maybe well organized and a really keen thinker, but was too much polarized on that line, he would have them do something else. He, it was always this attempt to balance out the rays. Okay, any questions up to this point? Just a no. comment, if you can hear me. Yes. I think those great composers were brought in for a reason to help balance these rays during this cycle, as you just pointed out. <laughs> yes, no doubt art, as well as science, in their own unique way, are attempting to bring these powerful integrative forces, particularly the seventh ray, because the seventh ray synthesizes everything. It synthesizes all the rays. And even if the rays are not fully in manifestation, and DK says that only five are predominantly active at this time, there is still, again, through the subplane uh, coloring and in residue from previous cycles, in other words, the cycles don't begin and end on a certain date. They reach an apex. The, they're like a hill. They go up, they reach a, 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 a high point, then they descend. And you can get a number of uh, rays overlapping. And this is where, if you would like, BL, I would really appreciate it if you could give our attendees 
some background into what rays are in manifestation and which ones are not. Okay. Um, this is from Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1, page 26. Um, and what DK says is it may be of value here if I give you the following statement as to the activity or non-activity of the rays. Uh, and he says, begging you to bear in mind that this statement refers only to our Earth and its evolutions. So ray one is not in manifestation at this time. Ray two is in manifestation and it has been since 1575. Ray three is in manifestation and it has been since 1425. Ray four is to come slowly into manifestation after 2025. Ray five has been in manifestation since 1775. Ray six has been passing rapidly out of manifestation. It began to pass out in 1625. Ray seven has been in manifestation since 1675. So there is this overlapping as race six passes out and race seven comes in. Um, he says there are, of course, lesser cycles within the influence of the sign Pisces. And that you will see that four rays are in manifestation at this time, the second, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. Excellent. Um, there's a little bit more here that I would like to Please. read, okay? He says, the question arises, how does it happen that we find people in incarnation on all the rays at particularly the same time? The reason is that um, the fourth is beginning to approach and the sixth is passing out, which puts six of the rays in the position of having their egos in manifestation. There are, however, very few of the fourth ray egos on the earth at this time and a very large number of sixth ray egos, for it will be about 200 years before all the sixth ray egos pass out of incarnation. As to the first ray egos, there are no pure first ray types on the planet. All so called first ray egos are on the first sub ray of the second ray, which is in incarnation. A pure first ray ego in incarnation at this time would be a disaster. Hmm. There is not sufficient intelligence and love in the world to balance the dynamic will of an ego on the ray of the destroyer. Excellent. Michael Robbins has written extensively on cycles. Philip Lindsay and his hidden history of humanity is really good if you want to understand cycles. And Stephen Douglas Pugh has done monumental work with the ray cycles. Okay, excellent. Um, and Chris, you have a comment from Chris. He yes. says, um, Van Gogh said that he was painting pictures for people who, were, who weren't born yet. <laughs> yes, the revolutionary who sees and senses something new in a higher vision, but of course is submerged and surrounded by the rank and file and the more orthodox. But some might argue that the opposition can be creative in that it shows you what you don't want. Okay, now what we've done is we've moved to the next ray chart. Now the one, the one I just showed you in Adobe Photoshop, we've hit what is called the blend mode, and it takes the seven rays and blends them together with the three astrological influences shooting up sort of from the back. And again, DK says that in time, the seven rays fuse into the three rays of, the three primary rays of aspect, 
and then the three primary rays of aspect into the second and first ray. So there's always this movement towards synthesis and amalgamation. And the Tibetan affirms that the rays, although having a, di a distinct life of their own, when they are put in positions with other rays, there's a period where they overlap. And this overlapping creates what is called mutated colors. It's not totally one, not totally another. And you will see this in these circular ray charts or spherical ray charts. And as we get into this, we'll actually uh, see a three-dimensional animated ray chart. Okay. So now we're going to move into our first video. So I want you to just relax, breathe evenly and deeply, and imagine you are visualizing someone's full six-fold ray chart and that it's in motion. And the motion really comes from the center outward. In other words, if the monad is the, what DK calls is really the only primary ray, and all the other rays are secondary and extensions of that first ray monad, then all impulse will come from what has been described in the Ageless Wisdom as the Bindu point, Laya center, or just pure being. It comes from a point, and the point becomes more powerful, and that is the will of the Father coming down through the monad at the very center of these ray charts, and then radiating out in a circular fashion. Okay. Oh, 
I don't see anything yet. Um, you you sound very low. Okay. Uh, let me. Is that a little better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. There. That's much better now. Is that too loud? No. Okay. It's good. It's good. Nope. I still don't see any. Con oh, yes, I do. We have a. Uh, Asha says, beautiful, inspiring, excites and inspires all the senses. Excellent. It's interesting to watch the sequence. If you really study the unfolding waves, and mandalic form, you can see that it starts off with the first ray in the center, the monad, and then as these waves, which have peaks and troughs, move out, they cycle through all of those particular six rays that each person has. So if you could imagine that there were seven spheres and all seven, well, let's say, if we're looking at the seven rays, you're talking about seven spheres. In this case, where we're just looking at the six fold ray chart, it would be six spheres, all interconnected, one inside of the other, but attached by this semi-permeable membrane which allows communications between them, even though each one is distinctly a different ray, different expression of God's divinity, they, they still overlap, interpenetrate, and blend to some degree. Uh, Dwayne, I have a comment. Yes. Uh, when watching that, it's, it's kind of, you know, that's, if you really see it as someone's ray profile as being your constitution you have your monad your soul your emotional your mental and your physical bodies there and as the colors uh go through the cyclic um or some become more intense and some you know fade into the background but yet it's all pervaded by your soul and your monadic ray there it kind of reminds me of sort of like the cycles that we go through in our life that maybe there's a certain time when we're developing one ray more than the others and the others are still there but the one becomes more prominent maybe it's a seven-year cycle or or something in our life and you could even extend that further to lifetime so maybe in a certain lifetime there's more of a predominant um that that whole flowing image there could be expanded out for lifetimes and it can be spanned out for one lifetime so what you just saw there could be you know representative of like a lifetime's worth of ray expression through your constitution where at certain times some are more dominant and others and then the quality and color are built in more and then there's the whole shifting of the rays sometimes we'll be shift from our personality ray from the beginning of our life starts to change before we at the end of our life and we're getting ready for our next life and then in the longer cycle even on the soul ray so it just kind of showed this whole constitution of the rays in a much more fluidic and um, cyclic um, 
uh, motion that's instead of stacked upon top of each other that represent a composite whole that um, sometimes is hard for our lower mind to see when we're thinking about our rays. We think them as these individual um, uh, separate streams of energy and rarely do we can we visualize them as a singular composite and what does that singular composite really feel like and even though this is a a visual it just gives you an idea even though you know actually if you were to see somebody's composite on like the etheric levels the colors and everything would be so brilliant and magnificent but it just kind of gets your mind thinking along those lines so that's what i wanted to say excellent comment DK says that the master reviews our progress every lifetime. And he can look at where we need to do additional work and where we have made gains. And DK and HPB also say that there are charts held on the inner planes in the etheric or in the Akashic records on a very high level that calibrate each person and to classify them. Yet I, I almost hesitate to use that word because it has so many negative connotations. But when the master who oversees certain groups and disciples and students within those groups his evaluations are always out of love and out of a, a deep sense of commitment to help those that have yet to make progress along certain lines. Okay, good. We have um, a number of comments. Yes. Um, Asha says, isn't the Gayatri uh, known as the sound of light? Yes. Excellent. Um, Sally says, uh, too beautiful. Amy says, the expanding and returning to the center was beautifully evident, as was plasma, which appears the same as water. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Antoinette says, it feels like a toro toroid in motion. <laughs> Yes. Hard, hard to say, Taurus or whatever. Um, yes, that's correct. Uh, uh, Bruno says it reminds me um, the Van Gogh's painting of the stars. It reminds how monads and rays are all interconnected in the substance planes. Yes, excellent. Wonderful uh, comments. And he's got a question. Uh, does the active rays at any specific time anything to do with the planetary? Uh, with planetary centers active at any specific time. You want me to do that again? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, does the active rays at a specific time have anything to do with the planetary centers active at a specific time? Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'd have to have more of a definition of what is active rays, uh, uh, like rays in manifestation right now, or the masculine rays, 1357, they're often considered more active and the 246 more feminine receptive, but uh, generically, I, I would say yes. The Tibetan has a magnificent description of how our solar logos sounded a great mantric sound. And through this invocation, the seven planetary centers, which we know are the seven well, at least esoterically speaking, the seven uh, heavenly men. And they, in turn, they sounded forth a certain mantric note, each one on a slightly different key, because they're all different centers of the solo logos. 
the different planetary logo I. And then the master's ashrams within these heavenly men, they sounded an additional note each time picking up the original note, but modifying it to the needs of the group beneath them or that they are responsible for guiding. And that the whole hierarchy of masters and planetary deities and even solar logo I are all interconnected by these hidden streams of sound, color, vibration, radiation, heat. And if you're up on your cosmology in, in the different sciences, plasma is clearly an interconnecting bridge between all, all lives. For centuries, people have thought, well, what happens way over there on those star systems has nothing to do with us over here. You know, something goes supernova. Okay, so what? That's like 100 billion light years away. But plasma physicists have clearly recognized and discovered that all these planetary deities in our solar system, our sun and all these other suns, and these uh, constellations and star systems are all connected together by these streams of radiation, electricity, magnetism, that's called plasma. And this is not new age fluff. This is science we're talking about here. And if you wanna learn more about it, go to the Thunderbolt Project Electric Universe site and they have revelation after revelation weekly on the idea that gravity is a very weak force and that it's really the, the streams of electrical and magnetic plasma that we exist on in this great network, often spoken of in esoteric parlance as the uh, net of Indra like a, a string of, like a, a number of jewels str strung on a string, and that if you, if you agitate one, it will send resonance to all the others, like a spider web, only more like a fractal or a hologram. And this idea that in the uh, <clears throat> animated spherical chart, you can get a sense of, as someone just pointed out, expansion and contraction. It's never just, oh, God breathes forth and everything comes into manifestation. That is actually a novel simplification. It's this constant interaction between the material planes and the spiritual planes, and it is an expansion and contraction, much like breathing. When you're breathing in, that's one dynamic. When you're breathing out, it's a totally different type of energy and dynamic. And the rhythm, the rhythm that is outlined in white magic is one of the keys to initiation, to be able to slip or utilize the folds or the positive and negative energies that create tension. And this is almost impossible to put into words and precisely why we're trying to use as many visual tabulations, diagrams, symbols, and most of all, animations. We are immensely complex beings and there's so much going on all the time between all these bodies uh, our own our own personality, six ray, our sixfold ray constitution, and all these other things in our solar system. It's just really it it makes the mind dizzy, but it makes the person who has the ability to step into it become liberated, free from the trammels and the oversimplifications of the mind, 
which we know are an important place to start. Okay, any additional comments? Excellent comments. A whole string of them. Yes. Um, <laughs> Francis says the guy tree is also known as the mother of all mantras. Excellent. Um, let me see. Helen says the monad descending through the plains, building the constitution of a man or a group. Yes. Excellent. Lisa says, sometimes it feels this way, such as breathing through the heart, and other times it feels more like vast planes of spaciousness that sparkles color, as yes. when uh, more in the mind tones vibrations. Excellent. Suzanne says, the, butterf but I can't talk today. the butterfly effect. Yes. Um, Marissa says, is there only one type of plasma or are there many types of plasma? Uh, thank you for the video. I found it to be very centering. Excellent question. And I'm perhaps not the right person to answer that, but I would say it's like electricity. Plasma is a form of electricity and electricity can vary from the electricity that runs through your home and powers everything uh, to all other levels of existence. They're all motivated by some type of electrical uh, radiation. So they are affected by some type of plasma. And uh, HPB and DK talk consistently about FOHOT and cosmic electricity, that everything that we know and understand and will come to experience is just a subheading of this great power called cosmic electricity. So plasma, I would be hard pressed to say it can be only one thing. I think like electricity, it could be utilized, channeled, and it may have multiple levels of potency. But that's just my opinion. If anybody else would like to chime in, feel free to do it. Uh, well, before somebody tackles that, I, I have another couple of things. Um, Amy says, can you please uh, repeat or spell the iatry word you've been using? I think she's referring to the um, gayatry. And I may be saying that wrong. I'm sorry if I am. It's um, the mantram. Uh, and it's G A Y A T R I. Um, I've heard it said Gayatri, Gayatri. Um, if anybody else has a better way of saying it, um, oh, if true. you if you just look it up, um, Google it, or I think it's even on Wikipedia, they give an explanation of it. So it's also called Hymn to the Sun. Yeah, it's a beautiful beautiful and and simple uh, mantra. Yes. And uh, Bruno says, like you said, at atomic level, it's the magnetic force that keeps the stability of the atom. Yes, the polarity of the magnetic forces keep it, give it life. And that's why when you study occultism and white magic, you have to study all the rays, particularly the three primary rays, ray one, two, and three, because they constitute everything that exists, either in the material world or the psychic world or spiritual worlds. Okay, I think, let me see. Um, we got a couple of more. Uh, Asha wants to know what's the name of the artist that sang the Gayatri in, in your video? Uh, Prima Deva. Okay. And she may have a longer name, but that's what I remember. Okay, and... Uh, She's very well known. Magnificent voice. I think that's all I've got right now. For some reason, they're not showing up 
chronologically. They're just kind of, they okay. get interspersed, but. That's good. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, Bruno says it's Diva Primal, Primal Diva Primal, I guess. That sounds right. <laughs> that sounds right. Do you, have it, do you have it on your slide? No, but I'll put it on. Oh, I thought it was there. I thought it, oh no, it doesn't say that. Okay, yeah, yeah, when you guys send me the. Yes. Um, thank you. Because we'll we'll do like we've done before and and post the little videos separate, um, so you can use them for meditations. What we're looking at in this next image is if we were to take the sun and look at its six-fold ray makeup and these colors and the rays that I'm ascribing to these different deities is purely pictorial because I know a few things about the sun. It exists in a second-ray solar system. It's a fourth-order monad, fourth-order sun. But I do not know what the rays of our sun are. And then you have, looking at this picture, then let me just enlarge it slightly. Then you have surrounding the solar logos, the seven sacred planetary logo I. And they, in turn, have seven subgroups and masters. There may be one predominant master, but there are a number of senior adepts and initiates that preside over that particular area, or let's say school. The Tibetan gives some of these planetary deities uh, interesting names like Venus would be the planetary school of, uh, you know what, I've forgotten. Does anybody know what the seventh, the uh, Venusian emeralds, it's seven, five emeralds with a tri triad tri uh, piercing through it. Anyway, it's the school for Venusian growth. And these seven sacred planets are centers within the solar logos. Then as you go further out, you can take the seven egoic groups and then their seven subgroups and then you can keep breaking it down to uh, smaller and smaller increments. But the idea is that, as we were sharing a little earlier, when the solar logos enunciates some powerful force or energy, it permeates all of its centers and then from those centers, those seven planetary lives goes out and radiates to the whole complete system. Now, depending on the rays, determines what gifts these greater beings are given to the lesser. Some people aren't ready for the first ray. So even if our solar logos is radiating first ray fire on a certain high level, uh, it could just bypass people that are in a certain ashram that just don't respond to that. And keep in mind that the whole purpose, well, let's say one of the key purposes of this, this grand tessellation or mosaic that we've presented to you is so that all of these different entities can receive 
can receive the gifts of the parent and translate it into some type of co-creativity action that will help all the lesser units, all the lesser cells within the body of this great solar logos mature and, and come to fruition. So even though this picture, in my opinion, is far ahead of a text description, it still, of course, is lacking. Uh, Duane? Yes. Okay, I have it here, the planetary school on Venus, the school with five strict grades. Uh, this is a planetary scheme closely related to ours, but its planetary logos is in a more advanced group of students in the cosmic sense than is our planetary logos. Most of its hierarchical instructor, instructors come from the fifth cosmic plane and are a peculiar group of uh -oh, Manasa divas of very exalted rank. They are each depicted in the archives of our hierarchy as holding a trident of fire surmounted by five green emeralds. Excellent. I suspect many of the participants here have some kind of affiliation with Venus, which DK calls our higher self, our alter ego, and much more advanced than we are. Although, according to cosmic law, we're supposed to be right there with Venus, but because of some failures or limitations, we didn't quite make the grade in an earlier cycle. So v Venus has sent these solar angels, amongst other areas, probably the heart of the sun, to be redemptive, to come down here and to guide struggling humanity with their superior understanding of the will of the Father and the love of the Son and the active intelligent aspect. Okay, great. Any additional comments or questions? Um, I think I've pretty much. Uh, oh, Joe says, having viewed the video and the pictures, I'm now feeling your voices as, as vibrations carrying the import, import of what we are viewing. <laughs> That's a nice way to look at it. <laughs> Very perceptive. And DK says that inherent within Every atom is a point of fire along the second ray line of love. And that the teachers in the future will hopefully embody some of these principles that they may speak so eloquently about. And this is rather a paradoxical situation because you have so many groups and teachers, it makes for a lot of conflicting information, ideas, and even techniques. But thank you, that was a very uh, powerful statement. Would somebody like to read this next quote? I'll read it for you. These multitudes of egoic groups form a radiant interlocking whole. Though all are diverse and differing, both as to their point of development and their secondary coloring. Just as the petals in the egoic lotus of the incarnated jivas unfold in different order and at different periods, so the egoic groups also unfold diversely as to time and sequence. This produces a wonderful appearance. Again, 
just as the master can by studying the group or larger lotus of which he is a part, ascertain the condition of the human units who go to its constitution. So the planetary logos can ascertain through conscious identification, note the term, the condition of the various groups through whom his work must be accomplished. Excellent. And the next image goes with that quote. In other words, this picture is identical to the one that you've just seen earlier, or actually several of the tabulations and charts that you've seen earlier, only it's a little more spherical. And you'll notice that the solar logos in the center is the bright initiating conditioning factor in this whole thing. And the seven sacred planets, they all are simply centers within the solar logos, and that's why they're co colored differently. And yet, if you look carefully, you'll see it's sort of like a rainbow, that those seven planetary logoi, or seven heavenly men, are not isolated from each other. They're connected. They're connected by the overriding potency and power of the sun itself, which is the dominant theme, but also every planetary logo eye has its monadic soul and personality ray, and those rays have sub-rays that coincide or blend with the next planetary logo eye. And again, this is a very hard one to depict visually, but that's why you have this sort of a blurred rainbow tying all of the sacred planetary logo I together. And as you further extend that ripple, ripple in space, you see that there are additional bands, colored bands, that link all of these different ashrams and groups and subgroups together. So what we're doing in this presentation is we're taking the mind and we're trying to analyze it to the best of our ability or as far as we can, relatively speaking, with the time restraints. And then we're pulling back and we're looking at it in a more fused, in a more abstract, and hopefully a more intuitive way. And it's this positioning of the concrete and the abstract that helps build the bridge. Any questions? Well, I don't see any new ones. Ah, go ahead. Go. Francis, can you? We can, we can just barely hear you, Francis. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. And that quote in the paragraph from CCF, was the end of the identification of the planetary logo in this process. And I think it's so important that we consider who and what we identify with. Yes. This is an important statement. And one of the key practical reasons to study the rays, the ray charts, the astrological influences, is because it allows us to understand what qualities of light that we work with. All initiation is the ability to invoke light and then to move into greater light, and within that greater light, even greater light. That is initiation. And 
we have light in our centers, our seven chakra centers, in our seven auric bodies, our seven ray charts. And if you understand what rays you're working with, you can understand what centers are being activated at this time historically in your life. You can understand what triangles you should lawfully and legitimately be using to make progress. Now, somebody can easily argue, well, why do we need to know all this technical information? Well, it's the difference between having the freedom to go out and get on a rusty old bike and go flying around the neighborhood at will and having the freedom versus coming back, parking that, and getting in a brand new Ferrari and going quickly out onto the roads of life. And there are techniques. This thing of the rays and all these different cosmological hierarchies, there's a purpose for it. It's not meant to bog you down in details. Yes, it can get tedious. It can get overwhelming. But there are certain parts of the ageless wisdom that may be written specifically for you. There may be a technique, a visualization, a special formula that on the outside might appear cold and unfeeling. Reminds me when my mother used to bake a cake when I was very young, and she always went to the cupboard and got out this book. And I used to say, well, Mom, when are we going to make the cake? And she'd say, well, now we have to know all the ingredients that go into that. And I'm like, no, let's just make the cake. And all white magic is the ability to put together certain key characteristics, certain key energies, certain forces in relationship to other forces that do the act of creating. And this is what's going to be taught in the new schools that are now embryonically forming, the new seventh ray schools that are going to make initiation into a science. It's already been done in the East, but the West has to have its own special terminology, its own special language, and it's going to be the language of science. People think, oh, science, oh, I can't stand science, so cold hearted, so unfeeling, and these people are too, way too mental. There are many people that are on the cutting edge of science, and what they are doing is, is plunging right into the subjective, creating the bridges and the avenues of escape for humanity one day to traverse, to, to liberate themselves from, uh, to quote the Tibetan, the trammels of matter. And looking from above down to have a bridge of descent or a conduit in which these liberated masters and initiates and adepts can dispense and, and send down these saving forces, these bridges of light. It's a two-way street. Anyway, in this image, it's just a recapitulation of the same quote that we saw when we started. And it follows perfectly with what I'm saying now. You've got our second ray blue solar logos in the center, seven planetary logo I with their unique coloring, sound, vibrational qualities, numbers. There's all kinds of subsidiary influences that uh, have to be taken into consideration. And then it filters on out. And how are they categorized? Right there. This is how we're categorized. And to go back to another statement I said earlier, this is how the master sees us. If you can see my, my cursor skating around, you'll notice that behind these seven ashramic groups, there's even additional ashramic groups. And I don't, I apologize if I appear to be uh, placing people because I have no idea where people are on the path, but let's just say we're, we're out here 
and we're we're in one of these ashramic groups in a in 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 a heavenly man's he has seven centers she has seven centers and we have to work our way from out here which you can barely see but there are these little dots into these stronger more vibrant centers ashrams groups and then into the a master or himself who presides over these lesser groups and then the master in turn with the help of the heavenly man draws us all back in to that center it's all done by a sensitivity to light we can talk about it we can pontificate and categorize but it really comes down to some very simple facts. Okay, any questions up to this point? Uh, yeah, we have a couple of comments from okay. Bruno. He says, yes. um, uh, and this was, I think, from a slide ago, that it was the picture of our solar system and how the rays adjust and resonate. Um, and then he says, science is the way the fifth ray manifests, very important as the second ray substitutes the sixth. Yes, that's a good point. Excellent. But <clears throat> science, when it's dealing with the higher aspect of the fifth ray, can be very much fused with the heart. People think, eh, I'm a heart person. No, I'm a head person. And we like to categorize. It's simple, it's easy. But that's when you get to really develop the mind in its higher aspect, it's not quite that simple. That's why you have to understand the difference between the lower concrete mind, which is made up of elementals that are involutionary and they are prisoners of the planet, to quote DK, and the higher abstract mind. Is, a, is an angelic, devic life. It's part of the soul body. You think of the soul, oh, it's just love. No, the soul is love imbued with power and will and active intelligence of a very high order. So how do we build the bridge between the lower mind and the higher mind? If the higher mind will take you up to the infinite, passing through the buddhic plane of love, the atmic plane of will and on up through. We have to learn the difference. We have to learn the paradox. And this is probably the greatest stumbling block to most esotericists at a certain point. How to use the lower mind to go beyond the lower mind. And that's a tricky proposition. And we will get into that in time if we haven't already in more uh, detail because. There are ways of using your mind to create that bridge between the fourth subplane of the mental, which is the lower, and the third, which is considered the higher, counting from below up. How is that actually done? It's done by, if you've studied your six stages of building the Antikrana Bridge, the Rainbow Bridge, perfect name for this kind of work, where you project a line of light between all these different rays that I've just outlined. Personality must become integrated. So the three lower lights of the physical etheric, the emotional, the astral, and the lower mental, they become fused into the personality note. Now they're really one overriding note that absorbs the lesser. What's the next stage? It's the personality building a bridge between itself and the solar angel on its own plane. It's built by threads and streams of lighted substance. And how is this connection made? It's by, by driving your, your, ray, your ray colors up through the power of the will to the next higher level. It can also be done with sound. It can be done with mantric words. It can be done with geometry. It can be done many different ways depending on your particular unique makeup. But the bottom line is, if you know what your constitution is made up of, you'll, you'll be able to bake the ultimate cake. You won't be guessing. You'll have a formula 
that somebody put down somewhere, somebody who is, uh, the, the, as the, the, the question goes, if you want to know the way up, you must ask someone who's just come back from that place. <laughs> A little play on words. Okay, any additional uh, comments? Uh, yes, Bruno adds, the second ray equals the mind and the heart synthesized. Yes, love wisdom. Perfect. Excellent. And I would just like to add, getting back to your earlier statement about, um, you know, where DK was talking to the uh, Dinah disciples and those that were the 1357 line, he would um, have them build in the 246 characters and vice versa. Well, this was something he told them a lot. Um, if they were very occult, he told them that they had to build the heart and balance the head and the heart. And if they were um, very loving and heart-wise, then it was the mind because um, they all had to develop that balance between the head and the heart. I've just dropped my mouse. Let's see if I can get it oh. <laughs> back. Okay, here we go. Now in this next image, we see variation of some of the earlier images that we've shared. I'd like everyone to see certain concepts from different points of view. And notice that at least in the center with the seven planetary logo I, you can see that they're actually, these spheres that we're talking about are actually in motion and that they have an inlet and an outlet so that they have a dual vortex where energy descends from the next higher level and then is released into the lower into the lower extremities of the sphere okay now we're getting to our last animation any questions or comments before we get to our closing i don't see any at this time Okay, excellent. Actually, we're not quite to the animation. What I'm going to do now is show you an image that is nothing less than profound. It looks like a shell that you might find along the ocean when you're walking on the beach. But if you take anyone, if you can follow my cursor, any of those charts, those circular charts that I showed you earlier, imagine each one of these bifurcations, if you look at my, if you look at my mouse, my cursor, they're just one of many. And they're all grouped together much like an accordion so that prior to incarnation, prior to the solar logos, prior to the one whom not may be said, prior to that great being intoning that mantric phrase that would bring all this into existence, he existed or she existed as a point of Pure abstraction, and that's why if you look at my cursor, you'll see right in the center of this unfolding corkscrew mandala is this inky blackness. This is what DK and HPB called pure phohotic will. And it's the will of some greater entity to express some quality that impulses or initiates all these lesser lives, this so-called corkscrew, this fractal corkscrew of descending life. And each 
bifurcation is on a slightly different level, but they all share certain common elements. If you follow my cursor, see this black disc right here, and then this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one, and they get more subtle and lighter as you go around the corkscrew, they are in miniature the same as this point of will, of abstraction, identification with first cause, so that every manifestation of the parent has built into it all of its seven qualities, even that point of abstraction. And it's that point of abstraction that collects. It's like the giant magnet, either pushing or pulling, that pulls all the angelic and David kingdoms and elemental kingdoms together to cohere into some form, mental forms, emotional forms, physical etheric forms. They're all created in cyclic cadence and in cyclic rhythmic uh, order of descent as they either go in, in this case, they'd be spiraling clockwise into manifestation. Whereas if it's spiraling counterclockwise, it's moving towards complete and total abstraction. And they can both be going on simultaneously. For those of you who have studied esoteric astrology know that around the third initiation, you sort of step off the uh, personality path and fall under the influence of the solar angel. And so you're no longer going around the chart clockwise, the astrological chart, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, like in that direction, you're going in the opposite direction. And as we'll demonstrate in other presentations, curious, paradoxically, both of these dynamics are happening at the same time. But the question is, are you on the evolutionary part of the screw or the involutionary part of the screw? The involutionary part of the screw brings you into density, fear, pain, and all kinds of negativity. The evolutionary corkscrew series of spheres brings you to freedom, enlightenment, beauty, peace, love, and ultimately the will of the Father. So look at one of these little wheels because in the next image we're going to see one little strand of that unwound and presented in more of a fifth ray way to us. And you can see if you follow my cursor, it's numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In other words, there's all the rays again. But notice they're more like, well, let's say if you took an orange and you cut it open, those little filmy membranes. Now, there's a technical name for that, and I don't remember what it is. It's been so long. But the first ray is the impulse and the activation behind manifestation. And what is manifestation? It's the second ray of love, third ray active intelligence, and four, five, six, and seven. And notice how they keep repeating themselves. This is the law of analogy or the law of septenary sevens seen visually. It's like a fractal or like a hologram. You can take any one part of it, and if you analyze it and you link that part up with its, that offspring up with its original parent, they both have the same nature. It's just that the lesser expression is, is not fully formed, not fully expressed. So we have unwound the vortex. And here's a real close-up for any of you who are unfortunately on your cell phones. It's very hard to see some of these images, but here again, they're separated, but they fold together uniformly into these magnificent corrugations, striations, and tessellations. And they're all moving, and they're organic, 
Okay. Take Fra a few. Yes. Francis asks, uh, might that central point of will and abstraction be related to the central spiritual sun? Absolutely. Our sun is a triple manifestation of deity, and the lowest is the physical etheric that we see out the window and go out and get sunned by. The heart of the sun is like the Christ principle of complete and unconditional love, and the central spiritual sun is the will aspect, just like Francis has outlined, and it is the uh, impulse behind it all. Okay, any additional comments before we have? Nope, that's it. Okay, so take a deep breath, relax, forget everything I said, and just... Okay, slight technical problem here. Now we're coming to a 3D spherical chart. I want you to imagine that this is who you are. In spite of your uniqueness and your contributions that may be vastly different than other people around you, there are certain similarities. Now imagine that there's seven of these and every one of these or six, whether you want to are thinking about the seven rays or just your six bodies. It's basically the same. They're interweaving, they're blending, they're fusing at certain times cyclically. And when you see this, if I showed you this image first, you wouldn't have the background. We had to go through all of this long explanation and these very fine animations to, to see where it's going and how these are going to be constructed in the future. Now, granted, this is lacking a lot. It doesn't have the brilliant colors of some of the earlier images or animations, but it really, really is very powerful. So take a deep breath.
That was Debussy's Claire de Lune. I recommend if people are as moved as I am by these animations and the music that go into Makara, find this presentation and then pull this up and put it where you can be in a meditative place without distraction. And it is very, very healing, very invocative with the classical music. And you can even put it on repeat if you want more than a three or four minute meditation. For those of you who are not familiar with the work Walter Kulin is doing, who's a member of the Moya Federation and like BL, a very advanced astrologer, he has developed spherical ray charts amongst other things. And they are really very powerful. I'll try to make a reference to that. I have in other previous presentations, but the idea that you can sort of look in and through. The question is when you watch a movie or an animation or a symbol of this power, the first thing you say is, well, what is up and down? Where's the in and the out? See, those are all con constructs of the lower mind. Very important as a foundation, but if you want to step into synthesis, you've got to take that information and step back and then just move into something more fluidic. And it doesn't have to be these animations, it can be in nature. Nature is full of powerful and provocative agents. The rolling of waves on a sandy beach birds in the trees, a sunset. Sometimes we have to go away from the obvious, get very complicated so we can come back to the simple that we inhabit and participate in all the time. Are there any comments that anybody would like to make on that animation? I don't see any yet. have to see ourselves as bodies of light, like a bird in flight, ever moving, undulating, full of latent powers, scintillating colors, classical sounds. That's why Debussy and Beethoven and others are held in such high esteem long after they've departed from this realm because they left us a bit of what Pythagoras called the music of the spheres. But only, only a touch, just a taste that will draw us deeply into ourselves with a full compliment and the full recognition. We have a few comments and then Francis has his hand up. Yes. Um, Suzanne says, absolutely stunning. Thanks and blessings to you in this multidimensional service. Um, Chris says, each turn of the sphere are lives moment to moment and lifetime after lifetime. Beautiful. And then uh, Francis, you want to go ahead? <clears throat> Just a personal experience in this very powerful and penetrating animation that in a way, these, the rotating vortexes and circles and waves represented to me also a demonstration of the rotation of the poles of our planet through this great yes. cycles within our, on our globe within this round, the shifting poles. Excellent. 
That's it. There's an inlet and an outlet. Even if there are multiple spheres all operating simultaneously, and as they outline in physics, energies can nest one within the other so that they're all a part of one overriding entity or electrical and magnetic force, but it can be broken down into these conical shells or bands that show that there's differences. How can something be different and be unified? Only some overriding force can do that. Any additional comments or questions before we close? Uh, not that I see right now. Uh, I'd oh, like to a, see this. Go ahead. Wait a minute. They, <laughs> it's been weird the way they've come in and come and gone. Uh, Antoinette said, what started with a mental projection changed to a heart in the head motion. Most beautiful. Excellent. And Bruno said, it's awesome work, if I may say. Fibonacci felt awesome fourth grade <laughs> there. Can't describe in words because it's so simple. Beautiful. Absolutely. Wonderful comment. I like to see these presentations that we're involved in and the Facebook group. How many out there have visited the Facebook group that we have that's been created to sort of maintain the continuity between sessions? Okay, good. I'd like to see this work as we're on a journey and we're all teaching each other because we're all a part of this grand holographic fractal composite in which each part plays its unique place. It plays its unique contribution. And this is a case where teachers become absorbed into the truth. And we all become teachers, we're all students, and these will be the schools of the future that have no walls, that have no desks, that have no bureaucracy, and only require your curiosity and your need to better yourself to bring it all together. Okay, great. If there aren't any additional comments, we shall sign off. I send my light and my love to everyone in the group and look forward to seeing you in the future or on Facebook or at the conference. Right. Um, I just wanted to tell you that we got a couple of more comments about okay, people, uh, people joining the Facebook uh, group. Joe okay. says she follows the Facebook pages daily. So many comments that open up into even more awareness and she yes. loves the resources. Uh, Bruno says he's on, he's on the Facebook group and he loves it. Um, so wonderful. Well, thank you very much for another great uh, webinar. Thank you. And good night to everyone. Good night.